welcome to the SaaS Revolution Show, or should I say welcome back to the SaaS Revolution Show, uh, Mark Roberge, uh, MD at Stage 2 Capital. Welcome, Mark. Thanks, Josh. Great to be here. Great to be back, I should say. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, it's, uh, it is good, great to be back. It's been five years uh, since we, we had you on. Uh, I don't know if you know it uh, or, or if you knew it at the time, but you were the first ever guest on the SaaS Revolution Show podcast. <laughs> uh, I got to so, my LinkedIn. I got to employ my LinkedIn. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, and obviously taking a, a bold leap there to, uh, to come on, a, on, a, on an unknown, unproven uh, podcast. Uh, and obviously we spoke in depth about your book, which had just come out at the time. So that was kind of the hook for me to kind of get you cool. on and speak about your book, The Sales Acceleration Formula. So actually to this day, it's still one of the most listened to podcasts we've uh, we, we've ever had. Uh, so great awesome, to have you. Awesome. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, so, so Mark, obviously we've um, uh, we connected uh, before, and uh, again, like uh, mainly five years ago when we we had you on the podcast. Um, uh, I think a lot of people, a lot our audience, you know, know who you are. Uh, my content manager, not throwing her under the bus, she said, "I don't know who Mark Roberge is." Uh, so, there, there, yeah. so it, it proves that not everybody in, in SaaS knows uh, uh, who you are. Um, so tell us a little about uh, about who you are. Um, uh, sure. uh, just uh, give us an update. Uh, who's Mark Roberts? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I uh, I'm an entrepreneur. Um, started a couple of companies. The the most recent one was HubSpot, where um, you know part of the founding team there. Um, there were four of us that met at MIT. You know, it was Darmesh's idea. He brought on Brian Halligan to run it. Um, I was involved as a consultant, then quickly came on board. And I basically ran uh, sales there. Um, so I, I took the company as a the sales leader from zero to 100 million. Um, took about nine years, took it through the IPO, um, scaled the team from zero to 450 people, kind of owned everything in sales and demand, um, and customer success and customer support. Um, during that journey, wrote a, a book toward the tail end. Um, you know, I was extraordinarily blessed that um, I got to build the HubSpot sales team in one of the first contacts where sales was largely inside. You know, it's hard to imagine, but we used to only sell through door to door outside teams. And when you did that, it was really hard to get the sales reps to use the CRM and it was really hard to get, get data about what's going on. And I was able to had the luxury of building a team that was inside sales first and everyone used a CRM. We had tons of data. And as an, as an ex engineer, uh, that was like a kid in a candy store, you know, and I got to, I got to sort of, um, evolve the book on sales on how you can leverage data and science to bring more predictability and process to generate revenue. And so that's what the sales acceleration formula was. They, Lots of entrepreneurs were asking me how I did at HubSpot, and I just codified it for them as a way to hopefully help the entrepreneur ecosystem. And quick aside, all all the all the proceeds are donated to a nonprofit that helps um, uh, kids with tough lives to to discover entrepreneurship. Um, so thank you for the support there. Uh, since then, I left about five years ago. Um, you know, the book did well and uh, Harvard Business School invited me to join the faculty there um, and start their first class on sales. So that's something I've been doing for five years. It's been a, a pleasure. Um, you know, it's, it's funny that to do it at Harvard Business School is, is such a blessing because they sell 30 million cases a year. You know, so not only do you have the opportunity to to help, you know, one of, if not the best business school in the world to figure out how to teach sales, but you also establish the foundation for how every business school teaches sales. And so that's, that's quite motivating to me, um, you know, to put, put the effort in there and you can, you can check out my faculty page. If you just Google, I've got like nine cases on sales in there, if you want to check them out. Um, and what the other cool thing about it was it, it allowed me, to spend a lot of time still in practice um, it encouraged me to actually spend a lot of time in practice. So I, I kind of warded off the temptation of being on 40 advisory boards and talking to every company once a year, like that doesn't, that's not fun for anyone and actually uh, picked one company a quarter to dive in deep on um, go to the office once or twice a week, listen to sales calls, talk to the, 
customers, um, interview the sales reps, look at the data and come back to the executive team and the board with here are the two or three biggest risks I see in your scale journey. And here's how your peers have addressed those. And so that, that was an amazing journey um, for me to kind of step back and say, why do a lot of companies hit a million and then just flatline? And some companies hit a million in revenue and become a unicorn. Like what, what's the, what's the, what's the kind of pattern recognition? And, and through that, I developed a, a framework that we can talk about um, that actually has, has helped a lot of businesses with, with those, um, with those decisions and, and, and I think help them, help them to, to scale. You know, I was, I was actually amazed during my journey at Harvard um, to find some research that showed that the failure rate of a business, an, a venture that receives Series A funding is 70%. Um, but what amazed me was as you look ahead to the Series B and the Series C, the failure rate doesn't change the failure rate of a series C funded business is 70%. And um, it, that just shows to me that we, as an entrepreneurial community, we, we haven't, we're not good at scaling. Like we're not as good as we should be. And that's what I'm hoping that this framework, you know, and, and doing, you know, webinars like this, Alex, uh, um, can help. Like, can we get that down to 50% or 40% and, and help more of these companies succeed? So, during that journey, I actually met um, a bunch of, you know, I, I built more relationships with VCs as I started working with these companies. I met a guy named Jay Poe who was over at Bessemer. Um, I think a lot of you know Bessemer is one of the best VCs mm -hmm. in the world. And um, he really, he'd been looking at this go-to-market problem similar, in the same way. So I really enjoyed my conversation with him. We spent more time together. And, uh, and he had the idea to start a VC fund on this, on this thesis, start the first VC fund uh, that's run and backed by sales execs um, to help, help with this, to evolve the entrepreneur knowledge base um, on this side. So, so we went out and it went viral within the sales executive you know, community. Uh, within, within six months, we had 97 uh, LPs, investors in our fund, all of which were, you know, the sales leaders from the unicorns in the software space. Um, and, um, and then started doing investments. So we, we did 10 investments out of that fund with this thesis in mind. Um, it's called stage two capital. Um, and, uh, it's, 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 um, it's proven out quite well. The first six investments we did, um, five of them got to their next round of funding within seven months. Um, you know, I was told if we can get, if we can get like two out of 10 to, to the next round of funding within 18 months, that's good. I was amazed that five out of six got there in, in seven months. Um, so who knows, maybe we got lucky, um, but I'm hoping that um, we're on to something here um, and uh, just keep working on it. And I'm excited to share it with your community and, and hear from them, um, you know, how it, it works and, and where the questions are with them. Yeah, amazing, and, and thanks for the background there. And so, yeah, I mean, let's let, let's go through the framework if you if you can kind of talk us through that. Uh, and again, it, it's it's great that um, this is something that you you you've developed through your learning and then sharing that with our with our community. So uh, excited to hear more about the sure. framework and, and share that with the with the SaaS up community. Yeah. So just to you know the the common pattern that I see almost all the time is. Um, people go through the product market fit journey, right? So like lots of people have read the lean startup. They've studied the work of Eric Ries. Um, you know, I think Eric's work is very important and, and changed the way we thought about entrepreneurship, especially in the ideation to scale stage, the ideation to product market fit, which he created. Um, we used to just build a product. We had to get an idea. We, we sat in a room for a year. We built the product and we crossed our fingers that it would sell. And his, his sort of like build the product with MVPs and with the customer and agile, it just, I think it improved the success rate from ideation to product market fit. I think there's, that's where we're broken after that. Cause I think when people hit that, they, then they go raise a round of fund funding. 
they go hire some big name VP of sales and they hire 10 salespeople in the next month and try to triple, triple, double, double is what they say in San Francisco today. Triple revenue, triple revenue, double, double. And that's what kills business, in my opinion. I, I, I think it's a, I don't think they're ready for scale at that point. Um, and I think they're obsessed with top line revenue growth prematurely, right? And so that's the, that's the, the framework I put in place is one to help you understand when you're ready to scale and to figure out how fast to scale. And there's three steps to it. There's sort of an advanced definition of product market fit, which we can go through. That's step number one. Step number two is go to market fit. And step number three is growth and moat. Right. So, um, so we can go through each one of those. So product market, advanced view of product market fit is I, I am a little bit concerned with the how entrepreneurs perceive the definition of product market fit. I ask a lot of audiences this and usually they're like customers and contracts and revenue and uh, that's representative of where we're, we're just obsessing with top line revenue. I can go sell a million dollars of software, but that's not the first important question is like, does it work and does it create value for my customers, right? So. I, I believe the definition of product market fit is the, the comfort that you can sign up 10 customers in a month or sign up 10 customers in a quarter, month after month, quarter after quarter, and two months later, you can look at those customers and a large percent, like 80% are seeing the value that you promised them. It's about consistent customer value creation. You can do that over and over again. And if you're signing up, you know, 10 customers a month, 10 customers a quarter, and two, three months later, you're looking at your customers and like less than half have set the product up, less than a third are seeing the value you promised them, you do not have product market fit. And we just don't look at that. Like that's not the first slide in the board deck. It's not like, how are we on customer value creation? The first slide in the board deck is where are we on revenue? And if you're between half a million and five million in revenue, the first slide should be how are we how are we on creating consistent customer value for the people who are signing up? And so the the problem with that, like we're, here we are on, on, in a SaaS community, like the best way to think about that in SaaS is retention churn, right? That's the wonderful. The problem is that it takes a long time to surface. It can take a year for us to know what our churn rate is of the customers we signed up today. So yeah, I call that the silent killer. And that's, you know, so, so I encourage people to create a metric, which I call the leading indicator of customer success. Uh, the value is calling it the aha moment. And that's critical. That's the most important metric I think at this point is how are we going to measure the leading indicator of this customer value creation? What, you know, what um, can we see in the first two months of our customer's journey that if that happens, those people are going to stick around with us forever. And if it doesn't happen, they're likely to churn. What is that? Now, there's no universal answer. It's not net promoter score. It's not they set up the product. That's where some creativity and entrepreneurship still has to happen. For Slack, theirs was 2,000 team messages in the first month. For Dropbox, it was uh, set, you know, sharing one file through one device with one person. For HubSpot, it was if the customer used five features in the 20 features in the platform within the first two months, right? These are examples of the aha moment of the early indicator of success. And that's something you, go, you need to go out and, and, and pursue. And that's the first key metric. If you have that, if you, and you, you get 80% of your customers there, you have product market fit, you're ready for go to market fit. Now notice like in that journey, I'm not saying anything about, creating that profitably. It is hard to invent a concept in a business and to get 80% of the people you sign up to see the value you just created. That's hard, just do everything like, who, who is it? Uh, I think um, Paul Graham, I think, is like do unscalable things. This is where it happens, right? You, you guys may know Drift, you know, I can't, Dave Cancel, their, their CEO is a good yep. friend of mine. I'm actually writing a case for Harvard Business School on them right now. And he, this, he, this is exactly what he did. I mean, in the first year of Drift, he was jumping on an airplane to go see a customer that was paying him $50 a month. 
do everything you can to make those customers successful, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so that, that's the first thing is proper product market fit, okay? Once you have that, then it's go to market fit and it's simple, it's do that profitably. So show that you can now create, get 80% of your customers after you know, 60 days to that point of customer value, acquire them and onboard them and help them see the value with good unit economics, right? So a lot of people know good unit economics, payback period less than 12, LTV to CAC greater than three. Again, the problem here is it's going to take a year for us to know what the unit economics are for the go-to-market motions we're running today. So we have to extract that back to a leading indicator and say, okay, if I want an LTV to CAC of three, how, do, how many appointments per month do my SDRs need to set up? And what, what's the conversion rate of those appointments into customers that I need to generate the CAC that I want? And what's the average revenue per customer that I need to hit to generate the LTV that I want? And let me start measuring that every week, every month. Are we hitting that? And if, as long as we stay above those lines, we're on path to having good go-to-market fit. Okay, so these, these, where we are in that journey has huge implications on our go-to-market decisions. Because if we're in the product market fit stage, I don't want to be talking to you about what price, what price and comp plan and quota, it doesn't matter. Just try to make all those people successful. When you get to the go-to-market phase, price, quota, comp plan, productivity per rep, demand gen, all starts to matter. Okay, so, so then once we have that, now what you have is you have this, this nice instrumented report on we're signing up 10 customers a month and, and this is how, what percent are hitting the airline indicator of success. And we're, we have our goals around appointments and conversion, all that kind of stuff, we're measuring that. This become, if those look good, this, we're ready to scale. And this tells us how fast. So this becomes what I call our speedometer. Because now I can say, okay, let's scale. And scale is not hire 10 reps next month and go. Like, do, do you know what, how hard it is to hire 10 reps? Do you know how many interviews you have to do? Do you know how many candidates you have to source? Like, do you know how much demand gen you have to create? Do you know how many, do you, do you, need, you need a manager now? You're not ready for 10 reps, but you can hire one rep a month. So scale is about a pace. So let's hire one rep a month and let's get those flywheels going. Let's get the recruiting, the interviewing flywheel, the demand gen flywheel, the leadership flywheel going and see if we can absorb one rep a month and let's watch the speedometer. And if after six months, the speedometer still looks good, let's go to two reps a month. Let's do that for six months, then let's go to three reps a month. And if it breaks, we'll know really early. We don't have to wait for the quarterly P&L to know if it broke. We'll know that week and we can intervene, fix it and get it back on pace. Okay, so it's product market fit, go to market fit, growth and milk. As you look at that lens through, the, through your audience, I don't know if there's kind of questions that come to mind and where that might not be clear. Yeah, no, 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 no. I, I think that, that makes absolutely sense. I think what you, what you said, I think what we see or, you know, what I see a lot of people do, uh, again, like, first of all, there's that focus on revenue around sort of product market fit, but not on actually the value, right? And the, the example you use about David Cancel, and again, somebody that I've, I follow, um, you, you know, uh, quite closely and he's, he's spoken at a few SaaS uh, conferences, you know, he talks about the hand to hand combat, especially kind of in the, the early days. Right. And now, exactly. yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure if he's now doing it now. He's managing, you know, 400 people or whatever. Yeah. Right. He's off to the He's on the growth and moat journey now. Exactly. Ex yeah. Exactly. So that, that makes a lot of sense. And I think again, the, the, the other kind of, um, uh, part on, on the scale side. So when you, in companies and we've seen when they they've got product market fit and they think they're ready to scale uh it has been as you, you you've seen and observed uh and i've seen as well it's like okay hire those 10 reps right and then this just kind of means that you know we're, we're now on the path to scaling but but actually that you know very rarely kind of it, first of all that's very challenging you know and very kind of really works out that well so it's kind of really nice to see just to break it down the way that, that, that you have uh, within that framework. Uh, so it makes, uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, um, but yeah, um, and, and, and like, uh, beyond that, um, so we've got that part of, of the framework. 
it's a product market fit, go to market fit, sort of uh, the, the, the moat side. So you say this is where David Cancel uh, is now. Um, what are you uh, what are you seeing around here in terms of like like with Drift as an example, what what they're doing, what he's doing on the moat side? Is this all around? Oh yeah, it's a good yeah. question. Yeah, because we didn't really cover the moat, and you know, there's so few words in that whole framework, and moat is chosen to be one of them. And that <laughs> hopefully that hopefully that uh, that illustrates to the entrepreneurs that it's critical. So the point of the moat obviously is like it's because as I looked out and why did some of those businesses flatline and why did they, why did some of them, you know, unicorn, there was this other like point where they, they went to 10 or 20 million and then they flatlined. And usually it was because they lost the product market and go to market fit because things changed in the competitive landscape because they didn't build a moat. Okay. So the, the takeaway there is you have this vision and you're, you're trying to scale this business. If you actually succeed, if you, if you, if you build the category, um, if you build the company, the competition is coming. I've never seen them not. Mm -hmm. they, could be, they could be peers. They could be Google. They could be Salesforce. Like they are coming. Microsoft, Microsoft is attacking Slack like crazy right now. They're coming. And so in the back of your mind, even at the ideation stage of your business, you've got to at least have a theory on, um, on your moat, on your barrier to entry. And I think there's a lot of confusion out there on what a true sustainable moat is. Most entrepreneurs I talk to think that a product feature is a moat and it's not, it's not. That's just like, that can be replicated in six months. It's not a sustainable moat. And so what you have to ask yourself is, imagine you, you did scale the 20 million in revenue and you have the customers cooking Imagine that like 10 rock star engineers quit Google and raised 50 million from Sequoia, got a hold of your product, reverse engineered it in six months and started selling it for half the price. Why do you still win? Why do you still win new customers? That's a better lens to look yeah. at mode development through. Okay. Yeah. And so like, if you want to study the academic stuff, which is highly applicable here, like Michael Porter's five forces, he has buried entry and he has a list of things there there's things like network effects and et cetera. I think like if you look at some businesses that did it, like Dropbox is a good example with the network effect, you know, like you start sharing your files with various people and, you know, suddenly um, someone else and furthermore, like the fact that they were freemium, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, it, by the time I'm paying anything, I've already been using Dropbox for two years. I've got two gigabytes of stuff there. It's just there's a switching cost and there's a network effect. Um, probably like a super common one these days is um, economies of scale through the development of a machine learning algorithm, right? So like a lot of there's a lot of um, innovation happening with in machine learning and, and AI, and um, many folks understand that the quality of the algorithm gets better as it processes more transactions and information. So that, that's a pretty common sustainable mo example mm -hmm. today um, is like, yeah, you, you're out there for three years, you have this machine learning algorithm, it's processed like a billion transactions and suddenly 20, you know, 10 rockstar engineers from Google quit and raise $50 million. Like, how do you still win? You still win. And they, they charge half the price. You still win because you tell the new cut, the, the prospects, like my algorithm's better. Yeah. Like their, their algorithm is processed a hundred thousand transactions. Mine's processed a billion. Which one do you want? What, you what know, about so that? What, what about like brand and, and community? That's exactly. That's the other big one too. Like, so community, like with Salesforce, the app exchange, huge. I mean, they're a platform. Mm. Like that's just in, and there's, there's, I'm trying to think of some up and comers now that, are doing that um but like when when some when people start plugging into you mm -hmm. or have an app exchange of like thousands of people like that you can't copy that overnight so yeah. that's a big one and then brand is absolutely you know i think hubspot that was partially our our win there not just of the hubspot but more importantly of inbound marketing so that that's another great example of a mo is if you could go out and not just create a great business but also name the category and 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 kind of win that 
I mean, by the time inbound marketing took off and our competition copied it, we already own the first 10 pages of Google SEO. We own the book, we own the conference, we own the, the, the LinkedIn page. Like if they copied it, it just fed our demand. You know, so, so that's a great example, Alex, today that's modern is like, you know, creating a category and owning it uh, from a brand perspective. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we, we talk, you talked about, I'd say, when, when you get to scale and kind of um, building this flywheel around the, 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 the sales teams and obviously only, uh, you know, currently um, well, a small percentage of companies do get to that scale, do, uh, uh, you know, are able to kind of achieve like building the, the, the flywheel to, to help them uh, scale. But again, like what you're trying to do is to, like reduce the number of, uh, uh, or with the framework, you reduce the number of companies that are, are, are not getting to, you know, series B, series C, uh, you know, if you can with the, with these learnings and then help those companies that are at the earlier stage, build these flywheels within their, 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 their sales machines. But what we, um, what, what I see a lot again, is companies that don't have sales machines kind of like built out or even they're, they're doing sort of pretty well, you know, on, on revenue. Um, but, uh, uh, a seemingly, um, you know, a little bit uneducated around how to build out sales teams, how to hire sales teams, how to compensate sales teams, uh, and a, a lot of questions on that. Now, this could be sure, a, a whole sure. separate, whole separate mm-hmm, podcast. Yeah. Might but... have to come back. Might have to come <laughs> yeah. back. Yeah, yeah. The short, right. I mean, if you want, I can comment. The short answer there yeah. is um, the 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 pothole people make is they copy their peers at other companies. And that, that what, that's what breaks things. Cause there is no universal answer to what is a great salesperson? Yeah. What is a, the right comp plan? What is the right demand gen strategy? And unfortunately like investors and board more members contribute to, or, to this problem in a way because they, they sit across like 10 boards and, and they see something work here and they're like, Hey, you should, Go talk to them like that, that work, this should work here. But it's, you, you really have to start with your context and context can usually be broken down to who are you selling to, you know, the marketer, the CIO, you know, whatever, uh, what are you selling them? Like how much is it? How complex is it? You know, et cetera. And what stage are you at as a business? And so when you, when you think about that context, um, that's where you need to start when, when you think about, um, what is our ideal sales hiring formula? What should our sales comp plan be? Who should our sales leader be? Um, what demand gen strategy should we use? Uh, what sales playbook should we have? Like those all need to be designed with that context in mind. And by the way, they change as your business evolves. Like your first seller is way different than your 10th and is way different than your hundredth. Yeah. Right. So, so again, I'd probably have, we'd have to probably schedule another one <laughs> if you want to dig into that, but hopefully that like, it, hopefully, you know, uh, just be careful talking to your, your other CEO buddy and be like, what do you look for in a salesperson or what's your sales comp plan and copying that. Be careful, appreciate context, yeah. appreciate how yours is different, how that may, may impact your optimal answer. Yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, conscious of time, Mark, as we, we, we've been, uh, we, we've been talking or I've, I've been listening for uh, some time uh, around the, the framework. Um, so uh, I, I know that we, we sort of need to uh, wrap up sort of shortly, just sort of wrap, looking at the, the future sort of this year for you for, um, you know, stage two capital, you mentioned that you've already invested in uh, around sort of like six to 10 uh, sort of companies. Um, you, you know, what are the, what are the plans with, with stage two? Yeah, you know, sure. To, yeah, so we were in. The, we just started raising our second fund. Um, so we're hoping to expand our um, those sales leader investors from 100 to say 150 or 200. So in the process mm-hmm. of doing that, um, we actually also asked ourselves like, there's a bunch of like super talented like late 20s, early 30s who aren't aren't like financially in a position to be an LP in a VC fund, but they can certainly greatly appreciate our, or contribute toward the, our journey in terms of like finding deals and, and finding talent for those deals, et cetera. So we're creating a, a, an emerging leader syndicate um, where those folks get exposure to our deal flow and, and commit to 
to you know annually contributing a small amount of investment into them but more importantly just like you know be aware of what's happening and and help those deals find talent etc so that we're super psyched about that we've got a test class of 50 and we'll probably add like 50 to 100 every quarter to that group we, we want to have a couple hundred people there um and so so that's that's what we're up to um and just just you can imagine what our investment thesis is it's very simple uh these are b2b software companies um there we 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 invest when they're between one and three million in revenue and we have a heavy 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 eye toward great customer retention mm -hmm. you know so if you're if you see a business between one and three million in revenue and they're north of 100 percent revenue retention we're extraordinarily interested and i and i think you understand now based on our our framework um we do find that before that they tend to be a little bit more in product market like development and that's there's great seed funds for that and after that they've probably kind of set this up and it either worked or it's broken and we just feel like that stage is when this uh framework is is best um best implemented where, where can people find you online if they want to reach out with a question yeah linkedin is best LinkedIn. linkedin is best yeah and and uh yeah, you can go to my faculty page. There's an email me button that does go to me too. Awesome, awesome. Well, well, Mark, uh, great catching up after uh, five years and, and having you uh, back on uh, on the podcast. Really appreciate um, you know you sharing the the frameworks and just sharing with the community. It's uh, it, it, it's, it's great to see. Uh, hopefully, we'll see you. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll we'll try and work on getting you at a at a SAS doc uh, uh, at some that. point in the uh, in, in the near future. Um, and, uh, and yeah, like, uh, once again, really thank you, Mark Roboche, for your time. Thanks, Alex.